Hey guys, so the tops of the most magnificent mountains have attracted people who have been striving to conquer every remote spot on our planet for hundreds of years. For many years, the world has known legendary mountaineers. However, history often washes away the risks they face working towards their goals. The mountain Salula Grande in South America is very difficult to climb from the west. It is over 20,000 feet tall. But Joe Simpson decided he was going to test his luck. He started climbing at a young age after reading Heinrich Herr's book, The White Spider, about climbing the north face of Eiger in Switzerland. Now, although Joe was born in Malaysia, his family roots and temperament were British. He graduated from university in Edinburgh in 1984 and decided to reach his dream of conquering Salua Grande. It was an extremely dangerous journey. Before graduation, he had already been the first to climb Karakorum and many other mountains in the Alps. If he only knew that everything would be completely different and yes, quite dangerous. So Simpson decided to climb the mountain with his friend Simon Yates, another climbing enthusiast who he met in climbing classes. The young, strong men decided to pick an alpine style of climbing. A much faster method that doesn't use safety rope railing, has minimal equipment required and the insurance is simplified. Everything was fine at first. They got past the glaciers into a stony area where they made a temporary camp. They started the ascent the next morning, where their climb started becoming a little more difficult. They had to drink tons of water, which can be a problem in the mountains. They had to melt snow using a gas heater, which took a lot of time. Climbing got harder, and thanks to the lack of oxygen making breathing more difficult, the ascent was almost complete when temperatures plummeted and a blizzard kicked up. Wet snow sticks to clothes, freezes, and becomes hard to carry. The last 400 feet turned into a nightmare. We had to do everything we could to keep from falling, Joe said. The last 150 feet took the pair about an hour. They were seriously frozen, but they made it to the top. They were weak, but elated beyond description since they felt like they were on top of the world. But that was just the beginning. The friends still had the difficult descent ahead of them. According to many mountaineers, about 80% of the problems happen during the descent, not the ascent. The descent needed to be rapid since the weather started getting much worse and heavy snow started falling fast. The climbers used ropes to tether themselves to each other and started descending, but Joe's ice pick hit its mark poorly. When he went to swing, his second hand also slipped. He fell and his landing was very unlucky. He heard bone break and felt a sharp pain. His shin bone impaled his thigh and his knee shattered. His partner went down to him and gave him painkillers, but they both knew they didn't have a good chance of getting down and help was nowhere to be found. Since they didn't have any extra water, food, or equipment to spend the night, their necessary stop was life-threatening. They had two 160-foot ropes. Simon tied them together, tied Joe to them, and started lowering his friend. He found a ledge and dug into the snow to brace himself and lowered his friend as fast as possible. They covered several easy gaps this way. However, during one descent, the surface suddenly disappeared at a sharp angle. It was a ledge. Joe didn't have time to yell and warn his partner, since he was already hanging above a gap, and he saw a huge, icy crevice below. Simon couldn't hear his friend because of the billowing wind and could only hold on to the rope. Simon's arms and legs were growing stiff, and he had no idea what had happened to Joe. Also, raising him back up was unrealistic. Joe himself couldn't do anything either. All he could do was swing on the rope and wait for death either from falling or freezing. This went on for an hour and a half, and when Simon couldn't hold his friend any longer, he started slowly slipping. He had to cut the rope with his frozen hands because he knew if he didn't, they would both die. Simpson fell down, and he was actually even lucky. He fell about 40 feet right into the crevice. He landed on a slight angle and slid along it for another 160 feet or so before stopping. He passed out, and when he came to, he saw that he wasn't far from the bottom, and the crevice was above him. 
Joe was lying on an edge. I told myself not to lose control, but I still started screaming, howling, and wailing. I was overcome by animalistic fear. Sometime later, he fell asleep. When he woke up, he started calling for his friend out of despair, not knowing that his friend had passed by several hours ago when he lay unconscious. Simon even looked into the crevice and called for his friend, but finally decided Joe must have died since he didn't respond. Simpson looked at what he had and started climbing the almost upright iceway. But that wouldn't have been extraordinary for a person with two working legs. Then Joe decided to risk it and descend into the crevice. He lowered himself about 80 feet before falling to the flow. He started crawling on his stomach and heard something cracking. It wasn't the bottom, but a sheet of ice and snow hanging above the void. I saw light ahead of me breaking through layers of snow, so I carefully crawled over to some sewn steps. My broken leg hurt terribly. He was able to get to the crevice that he could get out of. He fell to the ground and started laughing, but his trials weren't over yet. Even though he was able to escape, he still had a long trip ahead without food or water. He was distraught, but started moving along, making small goals for himself. He crawled the entire day and finally crossed the ice. He was tired and dehydrated and crawled up onto some rocks. The rocks ahead were very sharp and moving along them would be extremely difficult. He made a homemade splint for his injured leg, but often fell and was in intense pain. With immense effort, Joe gradually walked on. He was in great pain, but he set himself small goals and achieved them. He walked all day, but fell to the rocks in the evening with extreme thirst. A stream was rumbling somewhere under the rocks that made him even more dejected. I lay there powerless having decided that death was inevitable. I was overtaken by loneliness and hopelessness. I marched on so that at least someone would be with me when I died. Walking on, Joe didn't meet anyone but saw a small stream with dirty water and started drinking it greedily. It was like my gas tank was filled and my strength had returned. It was a very unusual feeling when I lost my inhibitions and became no one. He quickly found evidence of his partner. His camp was nearby, but getting there in his state was extremely hard. A song by Boney M was playing in his head, and he passed out again. When I came to, I saw I was lying on the stone. But it also seemed like someone had cruelly dropped me off near a store, and then I was on the ice again. Then I was hit by a smell that was like ammonia. During the night, he crawled to the bathroom near the camp that he and Simon made what seemed to have been a million years ago. He cried his partner's name loudly, but he didn't respond. Joe was taken over by panic that his friend had already left him, but didn't stop yelling. Simon finally heard and ran to the screams. After several days of a terrible journey, Simpson had lost about 25% of his body weight and had serious frostbite. He took two years to fully recover, was under strict bed rest for most of that time, and had six surgeries. Usually, mountaineers would quit after such an ordeal, but not Joe. He continued climbing and even wrote a book. In 1991, during a climb of Pachermo in Nepal, he fell over 600 feet, seriously injured his right leg, and almost lost his nose. From 2000 to 2003, Joe made six attempts to climb the north face of Iger, but the weather stopped him each time. During one attempt, he saw two climbers swept away. In 2009, Simpson made a solo trip on the southwest wall of Mira Peak in Nepal. He's now 61 years old and never blamed his friend for leaving him. He still looks amazing. Well, that's all for today. Leave us a like, comment, let me know if you've ever wanted to climb a mountain like this, and uh, we'll see you again next time.